Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We're delighted you could join us for a fast-paced half hour of political and otherwise scintillating conversation. Joining me, first of all, former state representative Cal Potter. Here's the... <laughs> Before. <laughs> I'm trying to hold that up so that he doesn't look like he has six eyes. There we go. Pretty sweet looking, 1980. Yep. And supporting property tax relief. And here he is a mere 28 years later. Yep. It looks just like 28 days. <laughs> oh, are you kind. <laughs> Tom Paneski. Truth died young. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Tom Paneski, professor of mathematics at the Thank University you. of Wisconsin Sheboygan. In black, a member of the mafia also. <laughs> to, to my, uh, to my right. <laughs> Ken Risto, bon vivant has some sort of job with the Sheboygan Area School District. I can't remember exactly Enforcer. what it is. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a tiny cold and I hope you don't mind either the Lauren Bacall voice or the um, near death. property uh, acquisition <laughs> for the district. I see. I am Mary buildings you want to get rid of? <laughs> right, everyone just settle down. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, trying to maintain order here for the Donahue Group. We're talking about local issues right now and there are some. It's been cold very cold and snowy, so things are a little calmer than they had been, but in any event, um, we have Snow haven't... removal's been well. Expensive, but well. Well, it's gone well. I don't know, have your complaints? Any complaints? I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. Not my neck of the woods. Not yeah. mine either, yeah. But, um, although I was driving down a poor neighborhood street, and uh, plowing wasn't quite as nice as it was on the not-so-poor neighborhood street, but... I think the, the, the problem you have is uh, in some of the neighborhoods, the old working class neighborhoods, there's so many cars in the streets because they don't have off street parking and getting people to move those vehicles yeah, and it gets very, very difficult. And I think sometimes they just plow down the center and, and really kind of hope for the best. Yeah, but, but I would agree. You know. And as what, now what former Chicago mayor lost an election because- Jane Byrne. Jane Byrne. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that, so we all take that seriously at the municipal level. Um, let's take seriously, true or false, a proposal by the great <laughs> We're Sheboygan. We're going to raise our hands like a <laughs> presidential debate? <laughs> uh, the true great, or false? The great Sheboygan, the greater Sheboygan committee, a um, group of businessmen, have proposed to the city council and to the county board that uh, human resources, <coughs> I beg your pardon, I hear that doesn't sound too good in the microphone. That human resources uh, job responsibilities should be shared equally between the city and the county. A committee has been put together, of course, always a committee. What do you think? I don't know. I, I will just, I'm thinking of it as a temporary arrangement until they go back to uh, search and screen looking for a new uh, human resources director. Not a good faith effort? Is that what you're uh, saying? You know, this, the human resources director of the county could help out uh, while we're going through this process and we don't have a human resources director in the city. But I don't think uh, having one human resource director for both entities permanently, I, I, I find that uh, uh, unworkable, but I can't pinpoint. I mean, they got so many different contracts. You were talking about contracts early so many different entities, uh, so many sometimes conflicts, and the, the human resource director is supposed to be, uh, how do you settle conflicts between the county and the city? Well, the human resources director might somehow get in the middle, but if it's one head, it may not work out too well. I think if we incorporated all the school districts in the county as well. And then your human resource director you just have from, the, from the, <laughs> the human the, resources czar or czarina. That idea, was being, yeah, that, that idea was being floated around uh, about 10 years ago or so. Uh, I know that uh, Superintendent Hitman, when he was here, had some aspirations to become the, uh, <laughs> the czar of education <laughs> for the Sheboygan, yeah. Sheboygan County. Um, I'm not quite sure how Sheboygan Area School District would feel about it. You'd have to ask my boss, but I'm sure he'd like it. Uh, but I think a lot of school districts are just, you know, people like their local school districts. They really like feeling that they can go down there and have some control. I can't imagine 
people in Sheboygan Falls or people in Kohler would want to run into Sheboygan and have to elect a, a board member in phase seven or eight or nine. No, I'm not and, talking about unifying all the school districts in the county. I'm just, uh, if we're going to, I guess what we need to address is what are the economies of scale by combining municipal well, entities talk, to do the same services. I don't know, you might talk about uh, hiring, you know, uh, an outside contractor for cleaning City Hall. But for the county, maybe they didn't want an outside contractor because they have a union. So you got one human resource director having to figure out how to negotiate two of those entities. And it would be easier just to go out and bid, bid it once. But now he's got to bid it for the city. He's got to go through the union for the county. I mean, I, they may have an outside contractor. I don't know yeah. for the county for cleaning of uh, county courthouse. I, don't know. I, like, I guess I'd like the idea to be explored. I mean, not so long ago we were talking about combining possibly police services. And if we can think about that, if that's worth study, it seemed to me that we should be able to uh, at least look at this and see if, in fact, this is a manageable or unmanageable situation. I mean, that whole issue has kind of just kind of floated away over mm -hmm. the last year or so. Exactly. It used to be what everybody it was the, maybe the flavor of the month, but everybody wanted to talk about that and look at that as a way of possibly reducing costs in the city and in the county. And so. Would this be the usual group of uh, characters that normally study this issue? Or well, would this is, be an ad hoc committee yeah. that the county and the city would bring participants to the table? I, I, think that's a, I think that's still an issue. I know that the, as I read the city um, council minutes, they have appointed the salary and grievance committee as the committee to meet with county folks. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Now, whether or not the county folks, I mean, there is a shared services committee between the city and the, and the county, but it is moribund. Um, yeah. I don't think it's met since last June, if I'm correct. Um, and it got off on kind of a bad foot, I think, on both sides. And there were some hurt feelings here and there. And so I think it's been a hard bridge to, to, to build again. But um, so I don't know what the county is going to do. Mm -hmm. But I guess I would second the, the, the thought and give credit to the greater Sheboygan guys uh, about at least bringing it to the table. I think the greater question is, do we have too many units of government? And I think the, the conclusion is yes. When you look at the number of school districts we have in the towns and the villages and the cities and the counties, that we ought to be merging. And that's probably something that ought to be looked at more seriously on a state level and how we could uh, combine and facilitate the combining of units of government. Um, kind of like the Kettle Commission? <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, but, they tried hard. But I think, you know, as was mentioned before, um, it's difficult to get people to give up their own local community. But if you really want to see substantial result in sharing services, you've got to do less in a way of organization structure. I mean, every school district has got their business manager and their personnel person. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you replicate this 426 times in the state, <coughs> and you do that in towns and villages and cities, you can see why there's additional cost that really the organization is sometimes the problem. And I think addressing the, the human resources person is, is a step that, you know, we should look at it, but I'm not so sure that that's going to be the great saving grace for the taxpayer out there. And as Tom has mentioned, not only do you have all these, government is highly unionized. And it's the bastion of unionization in this country today, not the private sector. Yep. And uh, you've got the county highly unionized, the city. Not only do you have contracts to negotiate, but you've got grievances that are spelled out in these contracts. And it drives you crazy. You know, I was in management in, in the state government, and, and I had to deal with grievances because that's what you have to do when an employee's got some grievance or there's some disciplinary problem you have to deal with. And it, it's a very time consuming and it's a very complex situation. And I could see where it's going to be very difficult to have one person uh, be over two very highly uni unionized entities. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we should look at uh, uh, sharing of services. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I did chair a, a Ledge Council Study Committee on school district reorganization. And we thought, well, you know, we could, there are probably 50 districts you could name right off the bat that probably could combine. And so what we did in our final package, and it did pass, uh, we put in that you, if you combined with another school district, you could get a bump in state aids um, huh. in your district with the incentive that this was a carrot to have them seriously look at it. I think we had two districts in the whole state in that in the period of time that even looked at it. Everybody wants their own basketball <coughs> team and their football yep. team and so on. So we're kind of our own worst, worst enemies sometimes. We want efficiency in government, but we don't bite the bullet and take the 
the difficult steps in merging government as we should. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we'll have to stay tuned and see if it's just a passing fancy or something a little bit more serious. Um, the uh, non-motorized transportation uh, committee uh, and the county made some decisions about uh, projects. The first, um, and I don't remember quite how many millions of dollars, but quite a few million, not included in the uh, package of approved projects was the pedestrian bridge. As you know, something that I am somewhat intrigued by, although I do like <coughs> the boats being pulled back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Barge traffic, I think, would be even more interesting. But um, uh, it appears the city of Sheboygan Falls did very well um, in terms of having projects approved. And um, it seems like it's really starting to move and, and getting, getting pushed forward. So I think that's exciting stuff. I have to tell you, on the um, Sheboygan Press website today, and I don't know for how long it's been on, but there's a poll, which I normally <coughs> do not participate in, but the vote was yes or no, will Sheboygan ever have a pedestrian bridge across the river? Yes, no, unsure. Yes, 23%. <laughs> and, and I voted yes. Uh, Several times. And then, <laughs> just <laughs> once. And no, 76%, and then the rest were... Uh, we already have a pedestrian bridge, the 8th Street Bridge. You walk right across it, then you go from one side of the river to the next. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't need a second pedestrian bridge. <laughs> no, and I, I and I think there's there's something to be said for that, and I think it'll just mean, you know, less pedestrian travel, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. But uh, you know, Americans are not going to round the round the bend, as it were. And uh, but uh, in any event, it'll be interesting. Well, when we had our visiting group from Esslingen in Germany, they loved walking, across, you know, from uh, Blue Harbor across Key the phrase? bridge to downtown, and they walked back in night Key phrase? Day. Key phrase? Yes. Germans. Germans. Mm. <laughs> from Germany. <laughs> from Germany. We wanted to give them a ride. You know, we had a little bus to take. No. Because we're Americans walking. are only going to walk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Our EFS students, too. It's amazing how many of our EFS students will. I see them walking around all the time and bicycling, and, and uh, they're just, they are constantly amazed at how Americans just don't do those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least. Yeah. Sheboyganites and people from small towns with their And community. now they won't between the riverfront and, and South Pier, but there you go. <laughs> well, we need a, a sugar daddy who's got a lot of bucks who will come up with about four million of the five million, and then it'll probably go. But when you consider what's the total non-motorized grant, 25 million, and this is five, one, one out of five dollars is supposed to go to that bridge, I, you can see why it's just not yeah. going well, very Well, you know, far. the Marsh, um, uh, the Sheboygan Marsh folks who want to build the tower are struggling with, it just costs so much to build things. Yeah. Why in the world would it cost $5 million to build this little bridge, you know, across the, <coughs> I beg your pardon, across the river? I mean, that just boggles my mind, and I suppose it's going to cost more than, you know, one or two thousand dollars, but... Five million dollars, mm -hmm. and then we had talked about it in a previous mm -hmm. show. You know, there'd be maintenance costs for sure, and so I just like that little barge idea. You know, and yeah, we could. You already have barge. You know, one of those pontoon boats, or just gondolas like Venice. Or? Yeah, I could even. <laughs> have, you know, you can't do it in the winter time, but uh, not too many people are walking in the winter. But certainly summertime, a little pontoon boat back and forth. Yeah. I'm thinking the three of us should buy her a kayak. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see her going across the river in a kayak. With people on my back, a right? Of those helmets <laughs> on her head. And, uh, it'd be excellent. And it'd the money go a long way. I mean, five million, a million dollars, that'd last forever. <laughs> hey, I have just an interest. Tax, you know, the investment. Interest it, only. It pays, so. um, <laughs> I have just an interesting kind of policy question for you guys. Um, the city has denied. Um, or a claim has been filed alleging intimidating and unlawful conduct by officials of the city um, with respect to Jennifer Reisinger, who is seeking money for being um, receiving a cease and desist uh, letter to take the link from the uh, off of her website to the Sheboygan Police Department. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have no idea what the committee is going to do, but I'm going to certainly assume that that claim will be denied. Um, I think it's an interesting question, and it's not as easy as people seem to think it is, which, of course, is that the city has absolutely no control over its websites and cannot begin to ask that its 
website be removed, for example, from the Playboy website or, you know, I don't know, whatever distasteful and unpleasant uh, group that has a website. I mean, none of us is an intellectual property expert here, but I, I think, you know, the First Amendment is certainly not a completely free kind of, um, there are restrictions on the First Amendment. And uh, I, I'm interested, what do you guys think? I always wondered what lawyers talked about at lunch. Now mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> well, it, well, I think kidding. intellectual yeah, it's, it property is. issues are real. I mean, that's some of the fun stuff you the, could be doing in law right law, now. Yeah. I mean, if I were starting over, I'd probably want to do something like that because they're great policy issues as well as practical issues. And well, it's irritating, if nothing else. Um, when I was at DPI, we started our database project for schools and libraries and so on. It's called BadgerLink. And it's badgerlink.org. Mm, right. Some guy in Illinois started something badgerlink.com, and he was selling. He was getting a lot of people who were hitting that site simply because they were looking for the state databases. <coughs> .org or dot, yeah. we had I think another domain name of edu, yeah. and, and but he was .com, and you know it was irritating to us because people were going there being frustrated, not being able to find these databases uh, and getting this advertising site basically that this guy was selling ads on saying, look at the hits I get, you know, and, but we couldn't do anything about it. But the fact of the matter is uh, it can be irritating when your, the, your product or your site is probably being used in a manner that maybe you don't quite like. But you're right, the freedom of speech today is such that unless they're doing something slanderous or libel, there's not much you can really do about it. Well, and I think, I mean, it's interesting, too, because even if you could argue that a private entities can say, you know, copyright infringement or trademark infringement, you can't use, you can't link to my product, I'm not going to let you do that, um, which I think is a decent argument. What do you do with a public entity where there's a presumption of open records and open mm -hmm. meetings mm -hmm. and so forth? Um, and yet, you could have a very nice city website, you know, linked to a scurrilous website, and to say to the city, you have zero control over that. I mean, I. Um, I was when you were talking, Cal. It reminded me that that I have an address, you know, on my house and my home, and I get all sorts of mail that I just really, really abhor, and I wish there was some way I could control what comes into my house in terms of even. The printed material, of course, I can toss it out, and I, I don't know. It is it is kind of an odd thing that um, indiv any individual they want to can link uh, their website to any website like a government website. I'm kind of surprised about the suit. I mean, it's interesting that the, it doesn't maybe because you're a public official. When when the city sort of responded, you know, the, there was all this you know concern that government was trying to intimidate citizens. I can't imagine in what way, you know, people are actually intimidated by a letter that says take your website off. It's kind of it's kind of a silly silly argument. It just seems it sticks and stones and mm -hmm. um, Great. I'm not sure. It is an interesting question because the internet, you know, is just going to create all sorts of interesting new law that's going to have to be made. I suspect the Supreme Court, when it actually gets down to it, almost always bends over on the side of the First Amendment, especially when it comes to public institutions, and you're just going to have to live with it. It's yeah. the way things are. And I think that's probably the answer, but I don't think it's the gimme uh, response that mm -hmm. um, various people who were quoted, of, co of course there's a First Amendment right, of course the, she can link to the I, I don't think it's that straightforward. I, I think it's a little bit more complex than that, but I, yeah. I suspect you're right uh, in terms of how it's all going to pan out. Unless the city or any other government institution can really show that there's some, you know, some tremendous burden that's been placed upon them by the practice, then I don't think it's going to be going no. anywhere. It's one of those things you're just going to have to live with, just like when I open up my mailbox and I get all sorts of mail solicited yeah, that there. I don't really want, need, or desire. Um, but well, and I'm not sure that's ex you know, an exact comparison, but um, but in any event, it's, it's inter interesting. We'll see what happens. And if the notice of claim, is the, if the claim is denied, then and it's explicitly denied, then um, the uh, filing party, the claimant, has six months to file a lawsuit. And uh, I think it'll be fascinating. And one of those, no lawsuit is fun, but some have more interesting issues than others. And so I, I for one, will look forward to that. So. Oh, well, from a public relations uh, standpoint, uh, he'll you know, make the paper. If it's, there's a lawsuit filed, it'll wind its way into the 
Milwaukee Sentinel, that the city's trying to blah, 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 its citizens. and I think all probably the radio Shibu shows will be Radio able shows will do that, and <laughs> Sheboygan will get a black eye again. That, <laughs> that, you know, that's just, there's a, you know. We're just a very sad. interesting place to live, <laughs> what can I say? Um, we reported, Ken gave us, I think, a nice summary last show about the um, a court of appeals decision that really pulled the plug on virtual charter schools in the state and our legislature and its infinite wisdom as we always say um, is moving forward to address some of the issues that were brought up in the court of appeals decision can you want to just bring us up to date on well the virtual schools <laughs> excuse uh, me there should be a bill on the governor's <coughs> desk by march 1st that's what they're shooting for from what we're reading what i'm reading here well been put in front of me to read um, and um, it looks like it's going to try to resolve some of the issues the court just to review was had some issues about whether teachers uh, in fact were teaching kids on these virtual online charter schools or whether it was just simply parents doing it mm -hmm. and if that's the case then you've got homeschooling funded by taxpayers which the court thought was in violation of state law among other issues the legislation that seems to be winding its way through the through the legislature right now is going to address some of those things. Uh, it'll be interesting, you know, the devil's always in the details, and then there's what's in the law and actually how it plays out. I mean, now the legislation requires some sort of definition of truancy for kids who are online. I, I mean, what are they wow. going to have? I don't know you how do you that? do that. Yeah. I mean, conceptually, I suppose, what do you they, do? They have to log in a certain number of times a week, otherwise they're considered truant. Our Quite frankly, the truancy laws that we have in the books are rarely, uh, especially at least in the high school level, really ever enforced um, for lots of reasons. You know, not that any, then there's the, you know, they, the teachers who are on the other side of the screen need to be licensed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most school districts already are doing that, in fact. Um, and so, and they are, they and only they are allowed to grade the papers and grade the assignments and those types of things. I, most of the school districts that have online uh, charter schools that I know of already are doing those kinds of things. There's some long distance learning, advanced placement course, college work stuff that high schools up in northern Wisconsin who can't afford to hire teachers to teach AP courses, that's it's called online virtual learning. They, they already have those kind of qualifications. So. Yeah. It, look, the law the law doesn't look like it's 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 restored the funding at six thousand dollars a student which is about what we get already uh, for every student I don't quite understand WEX argument that it takes funds away from public schools because the districts who are running those are getting money uh, it's, it's diverting money from say from one particular public school to the district coffers to run different schools uh, but we set up our virtual school, our online, we don't call it a virtual school, but we, our online learning school, the two programs, precisely to bring money into the district. Yeah. Uh, either to grab homeschool kids from within the district or outside the district and raise some revenues. It really hasn't done too much of that in the Sheboygan Area School District, but it's just up and going now. So. I, I think WEAC's point is that there are 3,000 kids out there in, in virtual education. I chaired a, a, a work group to develop some standards for virtual education at the request of Libby Burmaster and uh, uh, Senator Decker uh, and Senator Lehman were both on my work group and uh, she is now putting forth some guidelines uh, that will be written in law as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think WEAC's point is that there are a few districts, Appleton, one, Kettle Moraine, uh, another that are running very large operations yep. and of those 3,000 kids that are in virtual education they are tending to come from other districts who now are not being paid the six thousand yes. dollars Kettle Moraine is being paid six thousand right. or Appleton is being paid six thousand for educating a kid who res resides in another uh, district and I, they, I follow this case rather closely because the case, they said it was unconstitutional for several reasons. It violated teacher licensure, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that you didn't have to, ha you may not have had a licensed teacher involved. It might have been just mm -hmm. a parent involved with the papers and the church connecting papers and teaching. Uh, charter school statutes, which have certain uh, regulations that you need, even though it's a non-regulated school, there are some things in the statutes relating to that. And it also a third statute that was violated by the existing virtual schools was uh, the open enrollment. 
there's a certain time period right. under which kids yes. can leave their district and go to another district. So if you're at any time, you could leave your district virtually and go to Appleton or Kettle Moraine or something like that. Mm -hmm. At what point are you violating the statutes? And I think rightly so, the court simply said, this is a too wide open frontier out here. We need to have some types of rules and regulations. And so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, when the dust settles, we'll have virtual education, but we'll have it with a little more structure than we do right now. Yeah. See, I think that's the real interesting issue. I, I think if you're, it's just simply what you were addressing, Cal, is more or less the logical extension with technology of school choice. Hmm. You know, now I can literally choose anywhere within the state at of Wisconsin. At any time, really. At any time. Yeah. Uh, the real issue, though, is the quality control issues mm -hmm. that, that concern me. Uh, because when students turn in work online, I, if I were a teacher, I don't know if mom wrote that essay or dad or whether there's, you know, who's writing that essay because it's being handed and, you, and there's no supervision of the assessment or the test like you have in a classroom where students are writing it in front of you. Now you take that risk as a regular teacher yeah. with take home exams and things too, but um, you well, how much have some time control the kid is even spending sure. so-called in the virtual school. And I noticed yeah. that one of the provisions of the bill was that you need to replicate the time in, yes. that you have in, in structural school setting. And, and that's going to be interesting too, because you can regulate how long the student is online. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of interesting because on one hand, the virtual school is touting different kids learn in different ways and different circumstances. So the, the, they all really, really need to log in 180 school days, which is the current provisions mm -hmm. for public school kids. Uh, and typically a seven or is it six hour day minimum? Mm -hmm. I mean, so they, I mean, you're gonna actually, somebody's actually gonna monitor all that. I, I, you can do it technologically, how long they're online, how long they're learning. Well, I imagine the providers, yeah. Appleton, yeah. Kettle Moraine, whoever, Sheboygan, yeah. whoever's offering the program are going to have to have some way of saying, here's proof that right. this kid is not just spending one month out of the year at the computer and getting their right. equivalency for completing well, see, that, that whatever grade. That leads into another interest that these, maybe these kids are very smart kids, yep. too. And they don't need to sit, have classroom time to sit there and be bored. They could yeah. finish a program, uh, you know, a, a, It'll a be regularly scheduled in, program in half the time. Yeah. It'll be yeah. interesting or, you to know, because they're, yeah. they're, they're study good. those, you know, study who enrolls and such. But hey, we only have one minute left and we're just gonna take just a second to talk about election time. February 19th, primary. Not too many local races as far as I can tell, a couple, but not very many but we have a presidential primary. Yes, which may mean a great deal if February 5th, the 26 states that have their primary don't come up with a clear winner. We may be very much in the limelight because there won't be many many primaries at on February 19th. Maybe we get to have Clinton come to... Yeah. Maybe. We've Should got to wind it up. We'll be back in touch. Thanks for joining us.